ever heard of redlining? What about reverse redlining? The term redlining came from government maps that color-coded neighborhoods based on perceived risk for home mortgage lending and insurance. Unfortunately, race, national origin, and religion played a significant role in how the maps were drawn up and determined for decades who got access to home ownership and who didn't. Where redlining sought to preserve white communities by denying loans and mortgages to those viewed as non-white, reverse redlining involves targeting residents within certain geographic boundaries, often based on income, race, or ethnicity, and giving those targeted borrowers credit on unfair terms, different from what other similarly qualified people could get. Often these are predatory products, built to fail or loaded with significantly higher costs and fees. So what does this look like in practice? Let's explain. A defining moment in identifying reverse redlining was the Hargraves versus Capital City mortgage case. In the 1990s, in one of Washington, D.C.'s predominantly black neighborhoods, Reverend Clyde Hargraves was pastor of Greater Little Ark Baptist Church, a majority black congregation. Little Ark received an unsolicited call from a loan broker saying that he had heard that the church was experiencing financial difficulty and was in need of a loan. The fact was, Little Ark was equity rich. Their property was worth $400,000 and was nearly paid off with only $14,000 due on the original mortgage. However, Little Ark was open to getting a loan to pay off the rest of its debts, about $70,000 worth. The broker offered Reverend Hargraves a $160,000 loan from Capital City Mortgage. Hargraves expressed discomfort with the size of this loan, but the broker convinced him that the church would have difficulty getting a smaller loan. The broker assured Hargraves that after a limited time, the loan offered at 18% interest would be refinanced at a lower interest rate, thereby reducing the church's $3,000 monthly payments on it. The broker falsely told Hargraves that the payments were for principal and interest, and that the loan did not have a final balloon payment. Swayed by the broker's false reassurances, Reverend Hargraves ended up pledging the church property to secure a $160,000 loan from Capital City Mortgage. The loan document that Reverend Hargraves signed had many key terms left blank, such as the interest rate, monthly payments, and duration of the loan. Capital City refused to give Hargraves a copy of these documents. At the closing of the loan, Hargraves discovered for the first time that the loan had a $26,000 origination fee. This fee covers the lender's administrative costs, and usually is about 1% of the loan amount. Capital City's undisclosed origination fee was a whopping 16% of the total amount, and nearly half of that went to the loan broker as commission. Hargrave was only then told of a 25% interest rate and monthly payments of $3,200 for the first four years of the loan, and in the fifth and final year, the monthly payments would escalate to $4,000 with a 30% interest rate. Also, although the first page of the loan stated that the payments were for principal and interest, Capital City later deemed the entire monthly payments would cover interest only. Plus, there was, in fact, a final balloon payment required. When Reverend Hargraves attempted to reach the loan broker to complain about the undisclosed fees, he discovered that the broker's phone was disconnected. The church tried to move forward, but after two years of struggling under the weight of the high loan cost, Little Ark was forced into bankruptcy. Capital City then foreclosed on the church, gaining a property that they could turn around and sell. A lawsuit ensued. With the church bringing in less than $4,000 a month, the complaint alleged that Capital City knew, or should have known, that it was impossible for Little Ark to pay off the loan, especially including a final balloon payment. Other plaintiffs in the action included homeowners who had similar problems with their Capital City home loans. The lawsuit argued that the defendants targeted and marketed to black communities because they believed them to be unsophisticated or financially desperate and therefore more susceptible to their fraudulent lending practices. Although the case eventually settled, it was only after many Capital City customers had lost their homes or businesses. This was the first case to define reverse redlining. In more recent years, another case arose, St. Jean versus Immigrant Mortgage Company. In New York City, between 1999 and 2008, Immigrant Mortgage Company issued mortgage refinance loans under its Star Nina program. Nina stood for No Income, No Asset meaning that the borrowers didn't have to prove their income or assets in order to get funding. This program was designed exclusively for borrowers who had poor credit but significant equity in their homes. To qualify, you had to have high equity in your home, usually 50% or more, and a credit score below 600, for example. The bank did not examine a borrower's ability to repay the loan and instead lent the money solely on the basis of the value of the homes. Then, 
If a borrower fell behind on even a single payment, Immigrant imposed an automatic 18% default interest rate, which continued to accrue unless the borrower caught up on all payments, penalties, and fees. These unfavorable terms were buried in the fine print and never explained to the borrowers. Immigrant aggressively marketed Star Nina loans to Black and Hispanic homeowners with poor credit, with 80% of immigrants' total advertising spending going to newspapers in those communities, and 96% of their advertisements with images of people featuring Black and or Hispanic individuals. The case went to two separate trials in which the victims were awarded over $1.6 million in damages, attorney fees, and costs. But this was after many borrowers had been forced to sell their homes or face foreclosure, homes they had once almost paid off. This was a massive loss of equity and financial disaster for the plaintiffs, their families, and the neighborhoods immigrant targeted. Although both cases resulted in monetary damages for named victims, no amount would ever make up for what the families went through, along with the stress, heartache, and loss of their homes. This is the harm that reverse redlining causes in black and brown communities, already riddled with mass amounts of unfair lending, redlining, and inadequate investment. Here in Indiana, you might find predatory lenders targeting your neighborhoods in a variety of ways, including but not limited to refinancing, reverse mortgages, rent-to-own schemes, cash-for-home purchase methods, and more. The Fair Housing Center of Central Indiana needs your help. If you become aware of these types of transactions or are marketed to in this way, please contact us by visiting fhcci.org.